Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to Birkbeck. Um, uh, my name is David Feldman. I'm the director of the Birkbeck Institute for the Study of Antisemitism. And it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce our lecture this evening, which is um, the of a, a co-production, as they say, in the film industry. Um, it's sponsored by the Birkbeck Institute for the Study of Antisemitism and the Holocaust and Genocide Research Partnership, which is a collaboration between the Wiener Holocaust Library and the Holocaust Research Institute at, at, at Royal Holloway in the University of London. And um, I must say, it's, um, it's extremely important for, for the Birkbeck Institute that we are able to, and that we do, collaborate with, with both at the Wiener Holocaust Library and the Holocaust Research Institute at Royal Holloway. We are delighted to host Professor Wolf Gruner this evening. Wolf is the author of, um, I think it's 10 books. Among them are Jewish Forced Labour Under the Nazis, an early publication, a later publication in 2019 on the Holocaust in Bohemia and Moravia, and most recently, Resistors, How Ordinary Jews Fought Persecution in Nazi Germany, which is the title of his lecture this evening. Wolf will speak for about 45 minutes and then there'll be time for questions and discussion, after which uh, there'll be a drinks reception outside in a book signing and an opportunity to buy resistors how ordinary Jews fought persecution in Hitler's Germany for the reduced price of £20, as opposed from the bookshop price of £25. So who can say that the Tories don't have inflation beat? Um, at any rate, that that was not meant to be taken in any way. I, I really wish I hadn't gone down that road. So without any further ado, let me invite Wolf to, um, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to come to the podium, and we very much look forward to this lecture. Wolf. Yeah, thank you that you all made it uh, through the rain, which is so unusual for London. Um, I appreciate it coming from Southern uh, California. Um, I want to uh, uh, give uh, uh, thanks to the uh, organizing partnerships like Birkbeck, Royal Holloway, and the Wiener Library. And what I want to do in this talk is I want to start with uh, one story, which is one chapter of the book, uh, and go a little bit deeper into uh, the life of this person. And then afterwards, I will uh, talk a little bit about um, why these kinds of acts of resistance are more or less forgotten or ignored. And then afterwards, I will give a brief tour across kind of the variety of different acts of resistance, uh, individual acts of resistance. So let me start with the, now I have to figure out. Ah, okay. So let me start with the um, story. Um, please uh, go back with me till the end of uh, the year 1940. This is wartime in Germany. And a young uh, Jew, uh, his name was Hans Oppenheimer, um, he goes out at night um, breaking the curfew for Jews, which was established a year earlier um, when the war started. He left his four-story apartment building 
And when he en uh, entered the street, it was pitch black outside. And then, and this was pitch black because of the Allied bo uh, bombing raids, obviously. So when he then was outside, he waited till the Allied bombers circled in Frankfurt or around Frankfurt. And when they started to drop their bombs and the sirens started to uh, blare, he ran to the next fire alarm post and kind of pushed the button to set off a fire alarm. He set off the fire alarm to divert the firefighters from the actual burning houses. So he had this kind of um, planned for some weeks, and he did it not just once. So how did he get there as a 17-year-old German Jewish boy in Frankfurt to kind of set off these four fire alarms? He was the firstborn son of a merchant Sigmund <coughs> and his wife Martha. His father sold linings and other sewing, uh, sewing uh, accessories to tailors in Frankfurt. And the family lived a good life in Frankfurt. They uh, lived on an imposing boulevard in Frankfurt Ostend, where many Jewish families lived. In 1933, after Hans graduated from elementary school, his parents enrolled him at the very f one of the most famous uh, German Jewish schools, uh, the Philanthropin, which was uh, had been founded by the Philan uh, by Rothschilds. Rothschilds uh, in 1804. And despite the increasing persecution in Nazi Germany, this school was able to more or less shield, uh, shield the uh, kind of uh, pupils, the students, uh, from the kind of hostile outside world, at least during the 1930s. After Hans graduated from middle school, with good grades in 1937, he started an apprenticeship for two reasons. The first one was he wanted to kind of uh, learn a manual job to uh, help his family short term because his father had lost his business in the meantime. But the second reason was more important. It was actually to learn skills which would enable him to emigrate from Germany, to leave the country. Uh, and this was his personal experience because since 1933, anti-Jewish persecution affected uh, the Jewish population across the country, but especially in Frankfurt where the municipality was uh, kind of particularly hostile and had very early on enacted anti-Jewish measures uh, on various levels. So the, the new Nazi mayor in 1933 cut business ties two Jewish companies for the uh, municipality. In 1936, they were one of the first cities in Germany uh, reducing welfare benefits for uh, needy Jews. And then they also started very early on the organization of real estate, art collections, and private foundations. So he was then uh, uh, in this Jewish vocational school, which had been founded in 1936 in an abandoned factory, uh, and trained Jewish teenagers as carpenters, uh, lock, uh, blacksmiths, and gardeners, because these manual crafts were instrumental to kind of enable them to emigrate to Palestine, to the United States, or to Latin American countries. After he finished the apprenticeship, he registered at the Frankfurt Labor Office to find a job. However, in spring 1939, the Labor Office sent him, the, and he is 16 years old at the time, to a forced labor camp for Jews near Frankfurt. Um, the camp was part of an early forced labor program uh, introduced after the November program in order to exploit Jews who uh, received uh, state employment benefits or unemployment benefits. And during the summer of 1939, already 20,000 Jewish males were uh, forcibly employed on uh, road construction sites, garbage for garbage removal, street cleaning, and so on. After a year in this labor camp, the Frankfurt Labor put, uh, uh, Office put him on another train to another labor camp in Kelkheim Towns. 
This camp was only 10 miles from Frank, uh, uh, kind of away from Frankfurt. However, for a whole year, he would not see his parents because at the time, the labor regulations for Jews were kind of, restri uh, kind of more restrictive and more radical so that they didn't get any vacations. And on top of this, the mayor of this town who had established this labor camp was heavy anti-Semitic and he ordered, for example, beatings of the forced laborers even before the war had started. Uh, and um, he segregated them from the local population. And the conditions in this for small forced labor camps where only 20 to 30 Jewish forced laborers were housed were so terrible that one of the Jewish men committed suicide in this labor camp. So because of these experiences, Hans Oppenheimer then decided to do something after he returned to Frankfurt in the fall of 1940. And what he did was he set off fire alarms every night when it was possible because of the Allied bombings uh, in order to divert the fire trucks. In some cases, he actually pulled the alarm, hid in an entra entrance of a home, and then when the firefighters realized there is no burning house, they would leave and then he would set another fire alarm. So unfortunately, he only used three locations for setting off his fire alarm because they were close to his home and he was scared that he would kind of be caught uh, breaking the curfew for Jews. So one day, uh, uh, exactly on December 10th, 1940, at 10 p.m., the Gestapo kind of caught him red-handed when he was about to set off the next fire alarm. <coughs> he waited four months in pre-trial detention and then in April 1941, the main prosecutor in Frankfurt prosecuted him, uh, charged him with several felonies according to the criminal code, as well as for offenses under decree, the war decree against public vermins, Volksschädlinge. They had tried to actually try him for treason, which would have uh, received the death penalty, but they couldn't find a legal ground for this. The written indictment emphasized that Hans Oppenheimer was a full Jew, and the prosecutor pointed out that according to the Gestapo assessment, uh, after their in interrogation, Hans was an unstable, lazy, and dishonest human being, and he was eager to destroy things. Under inter interrogation by the Gestapo, Hans had only admitted to nine wrong fire alarms. However, the prosecutor assumed in the indictment that Hans was actually responsible for far more crimes, as it was said, because in his area, 44 wrong fire alarms were set off in the time from when he came back from the labor camp until he was arrested, just in his neighborhood. Um, the prosecutor argued that uh, the punishment should be especially hard for him as a Jew because he had acted in, uh, uh, as an enemy during the uh, war of the German people. And on May 1941, the Frankfurt Special Court charged him uh, with kind of nine malicious acts. During the trial, he was alone. There was no defense lawyer present, also not a Jewish kind of degraded to a to, uh, like law advisor, uh, nobody. He had to defend himself, and he was just 18 years at this point. In the end, the special court punished Hans with three years uh, in prison for sabotaging the war effort. Fortunately, the judge didn't follow the uh, kind of request of the prosecution to first to charge him as an adult, um, and also to kind of uh, impose harsher circumstances. However, the judge emphasized in his verdict that as a Jew, Hans should have paid special attention to the law since he was only tolerated as a guest in Germany. In June 1941, he was transferred to a prison in a small town called Dies an der Lahn. From the first day on, the prison ward put him in solitary confinement. Still, he was 18 years old. Isolated for months with no contact with other inmates, he had to fold bags and envelopes day in, day out. The conditions took a rapid toll on him. His only lifeline were monthly letters to his parents, 
And in these letters, he begged his parents to visit him, to bring him medication, because he developed itching skin rashes and painful teeth cavities. And he didn't get any treatment in the prison. Hans did not know that his messages and his letters often didn't arrive uh, at his uh, parents' home because they were kind of confiscated by the prison warden, uh, and uh, especially because he was so outspoken about the miserable conditions in the prison. He quickly, his quickly deteriorating health and his isolation exhausted him both physically and mentally, and Despite these struggles, he didn't back down. He still petitions the prison warden several times about these horrible circumstances and also protesting against the maltreatment by guards. When his parents in one letter asked him to change his behavior uh, because of the repercussions, Hans responded that this was not his fault alone. Uh, and uh, he said that when he thought about his life, this would uh, kind of make him crazy. And, uh, I quote, he told his parents, you know best that I never had the chance to visit a cinema, a theater, or a cabaret. In, November, in October 1941, he uh, tried to uh, commit suicide the first time. He was saved by a guard. Two months later, he tried it the second time, a uh, second time, and he was again saved by a guard. But for the time, the next months, until the kind of fall of 1942, he lived in these miserable conditions with uh, excruciating pain uh, and also kind of um, uh, with really uh, emotional uh, uh, kind of difficulties. And uh, in the fall of 1942, following an agreement between the Reich Justice Ministry and the head of the SS, all Jewish prisoners were kind of moved from uh, German concentration camps uh, and also German prisons to Auschwitz. So he was transferred at the end of 1942 uh, to Auschwitz, uh, and because of his kind of physically and emotional kind of weakened state, he didn't survive uh, for long. After a few weeks, he uh, perished in Auschwitz only days after he turned 20 years old. So this is the story of Hans Oppenheim. What can these kind of stories reveal about uh, individual responses of Jews towards the Nazi persecution? During the Third Reich, the Nazis often complained about the so-called impudent Jews in their administrative rep uh, reports. For example, in 1935 in Aachen, quote, the number of Jews who had sent letters and protested in person has become quite numerous and in their tone often impudent. End of quote. This didn't change over time, even during the war in 1940, the Reich Main Security emph uh, Office emphasized that uh, it has uh, receive, received information about the impudent attitude of Jews across the German Reich. Historians, including myself, we always thought the, the mentioning of the impudent Jew was just a pretext to kind of uh, um, justify new harsher measures against the Jews. However, there was actually some truth to it. So, for example, in July 1935, the Gestapo emphasized in their report for Berlin that Jews were born with disrespect for state authority. And during the same months, more than 100 Jews were arrested in Berlin for offenses against the state and the Nazi party. So you see the connection here. And later, for example, in 1941, uh, you have similar complaints about the impudent Jews in these Gestapo and SS uh, reports. And in 1942, when the mass deportation had already started and there was a lot of kind of uh, de uh, um, decrease of the Jewish population, there were still 1,200 Jews in prisons in Germany for these kind of crimes, which would make, uh, let's say, the British population uh, it would be uh, kind of 1.4 million people in jail for resistance. Yeah, that's the equivalence here. So there is a forgotten reality of widespread acts of uh, individual resistance. And my research over the last decade uh, revealed um, 
that hundreds and hundreds of Jewish men and women resisted in various ways and demand, this assessment it demands also a kind of a retelling of the actual story of Jews, how they reacted towards Nazi persecution. So my research strongly challenges the idea that Jews in general, but particularly German Jews, did not resist the terrors of the Third Reich. The traditional perception of their passivity had been based on two main reasons in my view. A narrow conceptual approach and a limited source base. And I will kind of explain a little bit uh, about this. First, about this, uh, the narrow approach. Since 1945, historians have discussed Jewish resistance, but mostly in terms of organized and armed resistance. However, Israeli scholars, from the very beginning, kind of try to challenge this narrative by emphasizing other acts of uh, resistance, including individual resistance. But most historians nevertheless settled kind of on organized and group resistance and armed resistance and that it happened mostly in Eastern Europe, not so much in Germany. For my research, I try to broaden the concept of resistance by using, so I'm not original here, I use actually approaches which were developed already in 1950 by Meir Dwojewski and then also kind of formulated by the Australian historian Konrad Kwied and the East uh, German uh, survivor and historian Helmut Eschweger, they all try to include individual acts of resistance into the broader concept of resistance. And this is not only true for the Holocaust itself, but in Germany there was a discussion in the 1980s about nonconformism as part of the resistance. And then we find similar ideas uh, raised by the anthropologist uh, James Scott, for example, or in studies on American uh, US slavery. So what I did is I used a very common uh, uh, and often cited uh, definition by Yehuda Bauer, and I just added one word, individual. And in my view, this changes everything. It's a very different kind of approach which guided my research here, that individual resistance is any individual and group resistance or action. And I think this broader concept uh, qualifies disobeying laws, protesting in public, as act of resistance. And I think this is especially true for Jews in Germany who were perceived as uh, racial enemies and also uh, lived under special anti-Jewish legislation. So to give you a, kind of an idea of how I think our perspective changes with this, this, this is a, a picture which you find in a lot of books about, uh, and usually it's about the terror of the, the first wave of terror uh, by the stormtroopers in 1933. Um, but when you look closer, this is not a random act of terror against Jews in general. This is a deliberate, targeted act um, because on the poster it says, I won't ever complain at the police station anymore. This was a Jewish lawyer in Munich uh, who tried to kind of release a client of his from the police station. Or this picture I use usually in my class to illustrate the initial, uh, initiative role of municipalities in persecution when they <coughs> introduced restrictions in, uh, for swimming pools, libraries, and so on. But look at the body language of this woman. And she let somebody a picture taking of this. Yeah. Or this family they let somebody take a picture in front of the most notorious anti-Jewish slogan which somebody painted on their house in a small town in West Germany. And this is the cover of the book, my, most, my favorite picture, and I saw this, I knew this doesn't need to be on the book. This is Lizzie Rosenfeld in Vienna in the summer of 1939, and she sits on a bench only for Aryans. So this bench was forbidden for Jews, and she committed three crimes in the eyes of the Nazis. She kind of disobeys the restrictions. She lets somebody kind of document this, and then she smuggles out the negative so that it's, it ended up in the Holocaust Museum in DC. So, and uh, this is another way how Jews uh, kind of uh, used photography 
to document cries, crimes. This is uh, a picture of a destroyed uh, uh, apartment which was attacked uh, during uh, the November program. So let me come to the uh, kind of second reason, the restricted source view, uh, source uh, base. So I think uh, our view was very much limited because most historians used official Nazi reports like SS and Gestapo. They didn't want to emphasize Jewish resistance anyway. Second, uh, they use uh, diaries and memoirs for kind of uh, finding out about Jewish behavior and Jewish attitudes. The problem is Jews don't talk in memoirs or diaries about these kind of individual acts of resistance. And this has also to do something with their understanding of the, or the survivors, uh, their understanding that what resistance is, the traditional way that this is organized and armed. So what I did in contrast is my, uh, I did research in local archives in Germany. Um, over the course of 12 years, I visited uh, archives in Berlin, Hamburg, Frankfurt, Munich, Dresden, Leipzig, Vienna, as well as uh, kind of Yad Vashem and the Holocaust Museum because they copied a lot of like local stuff, so sometimes it's easier to get it there than to travel to every uh, town in Germany. And this, uh, there I amounted uh, here are though unused sources like, for example, police logbooks, police records, trial uh, 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 material. Uh, and I added to these kind of materials 170 video interviews of survivors from the UC Shore Foundation. So let me spend the rest of the time with a short overview of, yeah, here you see that my favorite picture. Um, so what I try to do is, uh, since I found so many acts of very different types of individual resistance, I try to come up with some kind of organization here. And these are the types of resistance where most of the, the material is kind of, uh, can be subsumed under. So what I want to do is give you some examples for each of the categories here. So let me start with contesting Nazi propaganda. As a police um, records in the Shaw Foundation interviews reveal, Jews actually actively battled and fought, for example, uh, Nazi propaganda, but also specifically anti-Jewish propaganda. Uh, throughout the 1930s, Jews in Munich and Hamburg were arrested for destroying Nazi flags, uh, ripping down uh, posters, uh, besmearing anti-Semitic uh, uh, displays of uh, of displays of anti-Semitic newspapers, and one case I want to share with you is David Bornstein. He um, lived in Hamburg, and one sunny summer day in 1936, he accompanied his wife to a train station, or not a uh, bus terminal, not a train station, bus terminal at the outskirts of the city because his wife wanted to visit her parents. This, uh, he stood uh, in front of the bus. She was already in the bus. They talked through the windows. And while he was doing this, uh, he scratched the uh, swastika logo on this public bus with his cane, with his walking stick. And you see here, Kind of, this is uh, a historical reenactment, one of the first probably. Uh, uh, you see the man is a Gestapo officer, and the, the, the guy who is kind of presenting his wife, David Bornstein's wife, is actually the bus conductor who denunciated David Bornstein for scratching the logo. So David Bornstein was arrested, uh, he was put on trial, and he was punished with um, five weeks in jail for the scratching of this uh, swastika logo. After he uh, served his time, uh, he uh, was later arrested and put in concentration camp be because he was one of those uh, arrested for uh, with a criminal record. So these kind of acts actually could end you up in a concentration camp later on. Fortunately, he survived the concentration camp, and afterwards, he immediately left Germany and uh, 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 traveled with his wife and his daughter to Palestine. Still during the war, I have records about uh, Jews ripping down Nazi flags or anti-Jewish posters. So that's the first category. Oral protests. From the very beginning, 
uh, you, uh, we have records about trials uh, against Jews who spoke up in public against the persecution, about the first wave of terror against Jews, um, about beatings and murder, uh, and also uh, the torture of Jews in early concentration camps. Throughout the years, Jewish men and women spoke up in public, uh, everywhere, restaurants, streets, shops, um, and they were all tried under one specific law, uh, the law against preachers attacks against the state and the Nazi party. This was enacted to quell kind of the kind of a resistance of communists and social democrats. We never really realized that many Jews were actually tried under this law. So one case uh, I want to share with you is Henriette Schaefer. Uh, she uh, kind of lived in Frankfurt and uh, lived in a mixed marriage and uh, with the impression of the violent events of the uh, Kristallnacht, of the November program, the next day she enters the shop and asked the owner, quote, what are you saying about the fact that everything is being destroyed and the synagogues are arsoned, end of quote. The owner answered with the official kind of line, uh, oh, this is the outrage of the German people uh, because of the assassination in Paris. And then she replied, quote, this is not the people but the government. They are all blackguards, scams, and criminals. Hitler is the biggest bandit. If I could, I would poison them all. End of quote. Her story is one of the other chapters in the book, and uh, I can just share with you, she received six months in prison for this quote. So even during the war, this kind of public critique, insulting Hitler, protest against uh, anti-Jewish uh, kind of restrictions did not end. So for example, Hertha Reis, she was a Jewish forced laborer in Berlin. She was expelled from her sublet room uh, where she lived with her mother and her son uh, by a court eviction. And in front of the Berlin courthouse, she exclaimed in broad daylight in front of other passers-by, quote, we lost everything. Because of the damned government, we finally lost our home too. This thug Hitler, the damned government, the damned people, just because we are Jews, we are discriminated against." End of quote. Unfortunately, the sources didn't reveal what, uh, what happened to her later. Um, but in another case, which is similar, I can share a picture of you. This is Gabriele Reich from uh, Vienna. She was uh, um, sentenced to 10 months in prison for insulting Hitler uh, uh, and criticizing anti-Jewish uh, measures. So written protest. Um, again, similar to the other cases, since 1933, Jews kind of uh, intervened against uh, anti-Jewish propaganda, anti-Jewish legislation uh, in a written form. We uh, 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 have one form which is widely known, but often disregarded, these are petitions. And they are important because it was not just that they tried to be a, a kind of accused from certain measures, they also kind of reclaimed their identity as Jews, as citizens, as taxpayers, and as contributors to Germany in these petitions. But then, at the same time, we have also other cases. Um, so for example, in summer 1935, there were anti-Jewish uh, demonstrations in Berlin. And there were also some damage on uh, Jewish shops in Berlin. And Jewish uh, shop owners, they would write petitions to the Berlin kind of mayor and to the police president. But then, some Jews drafted anonymous leaflets, like this one, which I found in the police report. And I quote, Germany is a cultural disgrace today. I'm a German Jew and loyal to the emperor. In fact, German Jews should expel the foreigner Hitler, down with Hitler, end of quote. Even during the war, many Jews uh, did not stop complaining, criticizing the radicalized persecution. Uh, for example, in Vienna, we have tons of writings uh, against the expulsion from their homes. Um, and then still, there were also these kind of anonymous protests. And I want to share this one case with you, which is a chapter in the book. In Munich, 
Uh, Benno Neuberger, he was a former real estate broker. He had lost his business and um, his kids emigrated to the United States. So he was alone with his wife in Munich. He could not witness kind of the marriage of his kids, uh, the birth of their, uh, his grandchildren. Uh, and when the yellow star was introduced, this kind of was the straw which kind of broke the camel's back. What he did is, uh, after kind of some weeks after the yellow star was introduced, he sent out postcards, put these Hitler post stamps on them, and then wrote across these post stamps uh, insults against Hitler. And I want to share just two of them. Um, quote, the eternal mass murderer Hitler, disgusting exclamation mark. And another one was very kind of foresighted in a way, murderer of five million. Unfortunately, he made one tiny mistake. He used a postcard from his former real estate firm. That's how the Gestapo caught him. And uh, they put him on trial uh, at, the at the notorious Nazi People's Court in Berlin. Um, but there, even then, under uh, kind of this enormous pressure in the public court, tried by the most ferocious anti Semitic uh, kind of prosecutor, he stood by his conviction and he ex uh, ex uh, kind of explained that he hated Hitler because, uh, especially for, uh, I mean, in general for the persecution, but in, uh, especially because Hitler had pronounced the extermination of the Jews in 1939 in January in this uh, 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 well-known speech. He uh, did receive the death penalty and was kind of decapitated, beheaded uh, in September 1942 for <coughs> this act. And here's a picture of him. And he, you can see here, when you look up, uh, there is uh, kind of bruises on his uh, uh, kind of uh, cheek, which is kind of a sign that the, uh, uh, the Gestapo tortured him. So even despite the torture, he would not kind of uh, let uh, uh, this go. So defying, ignoring, disobeying anti-Jewish restrictions. From the very beginning, and some of you might know this, you can read this sometimes in memoirs, Jews kind of disobeyed rules like not visiting cinemas, not visiting theaters, um, libraries, um, but also specific, uh, let's say, anti-Jewish laws which were enacted after the program of November 1938, for example, to hand over their precious metals, right? Uh, or the, uh, to um, adopt the discriminatory middle uh, names uh, Israel and Sarah. And what many people don't know, and I didn't even realize, Name changes, uh, uh, that's a whole legal process in Germany. So the Nazis could not just say, oh, Jews have now the middle name from tomorrow on. Every individual Jew had to apply for the name change. And they had to pay three Reichsmark, fill out a form, go to the police station, and hand this in. And many Jews just didn't do it. You can find in any given archive in Germany, at least in those which I went to, and I guess in others too, dozens and dozens of these files where Jews were kind of cited for not applying for uh, these kind of uh, middle names. Uh, similar is Hans Oppenheimer is part of this kind of, uh, kind of category. Um, and then one other um, uh, instance um, is Max Mannheimer, who was a forced laborer, 20 years old, at a road construction site. And he's the one of the very few who actually left uh, kind of uh, or, uh, some testimony in private writings in a diary about what he did. And he wrote, quote, my home is in a wooden hut behind the tool shed. From there, I go to the public park despite the 8 p.m. curfew and despite the ban to visit the park. On my way, I count si the signs with the slogan forbidden for Jews. In total, there are six. Later at 11 p.m., I ripped the signs out of the ground and throw some of them in the bushes and some of them into the creek. However, all my courage was futile. The next evening, all the signs had reemerged. For a second time, I did not have the courage. I'm just not a hero, end of quote. And if you read this correctly, 
I mean, we would, we would probably strongly disagree with his uh, own assessment because just to go the next day again, again kind of breaking that he uh, should not go to the park and uh, the curfew. So uh, I found this one very remarkable uh, quote. Um, so the last category is, oh, this is, uh, by the way, a picture. Sorry, I'm a little bit behind. This is a picture of uh, Max Mannheimer exactly at the time of the first day when he did this, uh, 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 when he ripped out the signs. So the next one and the most surprising one is physical self-defense. So in these kind of records, it's interesting that in the uh, kind of public persecute the perpetrator records, I didn't find much trace of physical self-defense. Uh, and I will explain this in a second why. But in the Shaw Foundation testimonies, many survivors talk about that a Jewish man got into brawls with stormtroopers on the street, that they defend themselves uh, from harassment, from uh, kind of Jews who lived in apartment buildings who were kind of harassed by Nazi neighbors, that they kind of uh, kind of defended or kind of attacked even the Nazi neighbors for this harassment. So there are quite a, quite there's quite a kind of uh, um, uh, material on these uh, brawls uh, what men got into. Also, Jewish teenagers uh, defended themselves from classmates, Hitler youth attacks, uh, be it verbal or physical, and even and I want to highlight this. Uh, among 30 cases I found in the Shaw Foundation testimonies, 11 were by uh, women. And they even defended themselves against uh, male teenagers. And the last example is from a woman, and this is Daisy Gronowski. She was 16 years old uh, uh, during the time of the program of November 1938. She was from Berlin. But at the time of the uh, program, she was in a retraining camp in uh, Western Germany, in Urfeld, where they were kind of uh, receiving agricultural uh, education to be better prepared for kind of immigration, especially to Palestine. So this camp, as many of these retraining camps, were raided, uh, was raided during Kristallnacht by stormtroopers. And they destroyed the uh, kind of the furniture, and they also beat up uh, the uh, inmates uh, of this uh, retraining camp. So now I hope this works. Oh. How do I maybe? The kids. The kids. Oh. Yeah. You know the youngsters mm -hmm. and the boys. They were bleeding. And then all of a sudden I came my turn and said, hell, I'm not going to run. I'm going to walk. Here I am. I mean, five foot nothing. I'm five one. Five foot nothing. And I'm a skinny little girl. And all of a sudden they wasn't any fun anymore. And I remember one getting one on the back. That was it. I just walked through very slowly looking at all of them. Now here big tough guys. He wanted to hit a little girl. What, what can I do about it? Yeah. Yeah. It's the attitude. You know, and I only got hit by one, like a back hurt. And I, and I the got to the end of the line. One of them grabs me, grabs, grabs this, this hand, right hand, right hand, and starts sawing, sawing into it with a rusty, rusty knife. knife. Pocket knife type thing? Well, well I'd learned a little trick that's, that's digging, digging my head into someone's stomach, stomach which doesn't good. feel great. And, and I turned around to see what I could do with him, him. And, I and I started fighting, fighting. And, I started and I started kicking, kicking with my legs, legs, his legs. His legs. He, he wasn't very big either, he was young. young. Anyway, anyway, I finally, finally managed to get my head out, out and under the knife. knife. I, I twisted the knife out of his hand, I used the knife, I stabbed him, and I dug my head into his stomach. I don't know how I did it. It was just a fast thing that they had told me. And the others and the didn't others notice it. So a couple so of the guys, the others were too busy, busy beaten up on the film. So a couple of the guys saw it and they dragged him underneath, underneath a, a bed, or, or, or the, some kind of a sofa type thing that had hadn't been kicked over so the that the others wouldn't see him. He was bleeding. He wasn't dead, but he was bleeding. Anyway, that's when we took off. 
So just to explain this to you, uh, she was actually trained uh, uh, in jiu-jitsu uh, self-defense uh, as a member of Hal Shomer Hatzair in Berlin when she was like 12 or 14 years old before she came to this uh, to this camp. So this is how she could kind of uh, uh, overwhelm this uh, uh, stormtrooper. And uh, she had a remarkable, remarkable because uh, career, what I call a resistance career, because after, before she had already done some, something, and afterwards she escaped twice from arrest. Uh, because she got caught and then she escaped twice and made it to Cologne and from Cologne she escaped actually to Great Britain uh, and then from Great Britain to uh, the US. So let me come to the conclusion. Um, three weeks after Nazi Germany invaded Poland, the 30-year-old Edith Brits wrote a letter this, that was intercepted. The Jewish woman from Berlin described that one morning at 6 a.m., two police office officers knocked on her door. She wrote, and I quote, I'm so upset that I could attack anybody who wants to come into my pad. I will go crazy if there will be more. They stole my sleep, they stole everything from me, end of quote. I think this citation reveals a level of anger, kind of and repulsion uh, and anxiety that many Jews must have felt after years of accumulating radicalized persecution. And I think that these kind of emotions might have motivated some of the uh, uh, resistance act which I found in the uh, archives or in the Shoah Foundation <coughs> testimonies. So when we define resistance as any individual or group uh, action against Nazi laws, um, it changes our perspective. Uh, as I shared here, my research brought to light an incredible amount of uh, courageous acts, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah? So I found really hundreds and hundreds. Often the problem is there's not a lot of material. Yeah? So in the book, what I did is I have five uh, life stories where I did a deep dive into the life, and then I show at the end of each chapter that uh, there are many more other cases. So that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, as I shared with you, I kind of came up with these five categories to, uh, to kind of, in a way, organize these very different uh, individual acts. And what I would say is, uh, which is really important, my research did not reveal any pattern. There are no character, character traits which enable somebody to do resistance. Uh, the pattern is, there were equal amount of women than men, or as men. There were uh, young and old, as I tried to show here too. So uh, I didn't mention uh, Benno Neuburger was 70 years old when he kind of wrote these postcards. Um, uh, there was no difference in socialization, education, like geography. So there is not, there are some trends. So younger um, men were more prone to physical self-defense, obviously. Elderly were more against these kind of name uh, adoptions. But in general, we can't really see a pattern. Although over time, the type of resistance, what they, the individuals did changed because of the differing, differing anti-Jewish measures. So they reacted to each kind of different legislation in a different way. So uh, I think Rabbi Max Nussbaum really kind of put this in a, uh, uh, in a nice form, saying in the 1960s, he wrote, I quote, we were besieged in a hundred of different manners, and therefore we fought back in a hundred of different manners, end of quote. So some might question, are these small acts really resistance? And uh, what I th think, and I'm kind of writing this in the conclusion of the book, is that it's not up to us as scholars to define what actually ex the resistance is, although I try this here, but uh, in general, I th actually, I think it's not my part. It's also not the survivors who can actually define what resistance is, um, and it's also not the public. The only ones who really could define what resistance is were the perpetrators. They, uh, resistance was what they perceived as a threat. And that's what they went after. And that's what they punished, often very harshly, uh, uh, as I tried to show. So understanding Jewish men and women as historical actors 
is now is possible with this kind of material. Um, I think the courageous acts of resistors like Hans Oppenheimer or Daisy Gronowski or Benno Neuburger needs to be incorporated in our standard narrative of the Holocaust. Um, and I think the over kind of the majority of or the kind of the sheer number and variety of these resistance acts really render this old notion of Jewish passivity uh, obsolete for uh, once and for all. Thank you.